Water, the single most important natural resource on Earth. Be it fresh, brackish, or salt, vapor, liquid, or solid, its constant supply on our planet is essential to life, both great and small. For centuries, mankind has been exposed to waterborne pathogens that cause severe intestinal diseases, including dysentery, cholera, giardiasis, and many others. Worldwide, these diseases still result in illness and death in many developing countries. The practice of disinfecting water has virtually eliminated those diseases in the U.S. and other developed countries. Natural waters usually contain many forms of microorganisms. Some of these microorganisms are pathogens which are responsible for waterborne illnesses such as dysentery, typhoid fever, cholera, and gastroenteritis. Water that is used for drinking and cooking must be free of these pathogens. There are three main groups of pathogens to consider in water treatment. Bacteria, viruses, and protozoa. Whether a person contracts a disease from water depends on the type of pathogens present, the number of organisms in the water, or density, the strength of the organism, or virulence, the volume of contaminated water ingested, and the susceptibility of the individual. Disinfection, then, is the specific treatment of water that destroys, inactivates, or reduces most pathogenic microorganisms to the levels designated safe by public health standards. An effective disinfection process kills or inactivates all pathogens in the water. It is automatic, simply maintained, safe, and inexpensive. An ideal system treats all water and provides residual long-term disinfection. It is important to note, however, that disinfection is not to be confused with sterilization, which is the complete destruction of all organisms. Sterilization is not necessary in water treatment and it is also quite expensive. Utilities that disinfect can use a number of methods, some chemical and some physical. Examples of the chemical methods include chlorination with chlorine gas, sodium hypochlorite, calcium hypochlorite, chlorine dioxide, or chloramines, which are made by combining chlorine and ammonia, and disinfection using ozone. Examples of the physical methods include heat and ultraviolet radiation. A utility's choice of disinfectant is based on consideration of many factors, including the water chemistry, type of organism, potential effectiveness, safety, and security. Whenever you decide to change, add, or remove a chemical that is applied to the water, you must first receive approval from the MDE Water Supply Program. Chlorine and chlorine-based compounds are the only disinfectants known that can provide a continuing level of disinfection, known as secondary or residual disinfection, after water has left the treatment plant and enters the distribution system. Secondary disinfection with chlorine in some form is required by law for those community water systems required to disinfect their water to protect against microbial growth and contamination in the distribution system. Water that is free of pathogens can become contaminated in the distribution system itself. For example, backflow during low pressure situations. Maintaining a chlorine residual will help to provide a safeguard in the event that contamination should occur in the distribution system. Chlorine readily reacts with chemical compounds, microorganisms, small animals, and plant material to create compounds that contribute to tastes, odors, and colors in the water. These compounds use up the chlorine and comprise what is known as the chlorine demand. The goal is to add enough chlorine to the water to meet and exceed that demand. The chlorine that does not combine with unwanted components in the water is the free residual chlorine and is available to provide residual disinfection. This will be explained in more detail later in the program. Here in Maryland, small water system operators most commonly work with chlorine and sodium or calcium hypochlorite to disinfect our water supplies. Chlorine as a gas is greenish yellow with a penetrating and distinctive odor. The gas is two and a half times heavier than air. By itself, it's non-flammable and non-explosive, but it will support combustion. When the temperature rises, so does the vapor pressure of the chlorine. 
This means when the temperature increases, the pressure of the chlorine gas inside the chlorine container will increase, potentially causing tank leaks and ruptures. Sodium hypochlorite is the most common aqueous hypochlorite solution, while calcium hypochlorite is the most common form of dry solid hypochlorite. Sodium hypochlorite is produced when chlorine gas is dissolved in a sodium hydroxide solution. Sodium hypochlorite solution typically contains 12.5% available chlorine. It's a corrosive chemical and degrades over time with exposure to light. Calcium hypochlorite, on the other hand, is formed from the precipitate that results from dissolving chlorine gas in a solution of calcium oxide or lime and sodium hydroxide. Calcium hypochlorite must be stored in a cool, dry place because of its reaction with moisture and heat. There has been a long history of disinfection in the water treatment industry. There are many benefits and drawbacks to each type of disinfection method. For example, chlorine gas. Some of the advantages include a long history of use as a water disinfectant. It is simple to feed, readily available, and is cost effective. The disadvantages include it can be dangerous to handle and is becoming more regulated. Advantages of the next compound, sodium hypochlorite, include availability in different purity ranges, 1 to 5.25% for household use and 12 to 15% purity for industrial use. And it can be fed neat, as is, or in a solution with water and is safer to work with than chlorine gas. Some of the disadvantages are the strength weakens due to high temperature, sunlight exposure, and limited shelf life. Personal protective equipment is needed when handling sodium hypochlorite due to its high pH value of 10 to a 12. Calcium hypochlorite's advantage include a high level of available chlorine, 65 to 70 percent, and ease of transport. Some disadvantages include reactivity with hydrocarbons such as oils and paint, and it has a maximum shelf life of two to three months. Granular calcium hypochlorite commercially available typically contains 65% available chlorine. This means that 1.5 pounds of calcium hypochlorite contains the equivalent of one pound of chlorine. When it reacts with water, calcium hypochlorite also produces hypochlorous acid. Like the sodium hypochlorite solution, the addition of calcium hypochlorite to water yields hydroxyl ions that will increase the pH of the water. The use of hypochlorite to treat potable water essentially achieves the same result as chlorine gas. But what result is that, you might ask? When chlorine is added to water, several chemical reactions occur, some involving the molecules of the water itself and some involving the organic and inorganic substances suspended in the water. Chlorine will combine with these substances to form chlorine compounds, some of which have disinfecting properties some of which do not. In a similar fashion, chlorine reacts with the water itself and produces some substances with disinfecting properties. If you continue to add chlorine, you will eventually reach a point where the reaction with organic and inorganic materials stops. At this point, you have satisfied the chlorine demand. The total of all compounds with disinfecting properties plus any remaining free or uncombined chlorine is known as the chlorine residual. The presence of this measurable chlorine residual is what indicates to the operator that all possible chemical reactions have taken place and that there is still sufficient available residual chlorine to inactivate any microorganisms present in the water supply and to protect the distribution system water quality. Now, if you add together the amount of chlorine needed to satisfy the chlorine demand and the amount of chlorine residual needed for disinfection, you will have the chlorine dose. This is the amount of chlorine you will add to the water to disinfect it. So, the goal is to apply an adequate dose that satisfies any demand and produces a residual. There are two general types of residual chlorine produced in chlorinated water free residual chlorine and combined residual chlorine. It should be noted that free plus combined equals total residual chlorine. The free and total residual chlorine can be measured using various test methods. To obtain the combined residual, free is subtracted from total. Free residual chlorine refers to chlorine, Cl2, hypochlorous acid, HOCl, and the hypochlorite ion, OCl. 
Combined residual chlorine generally refers to the chlorine ammonia compounds of monochloramine, NH2Cl, dichloramine, NHCl2, and trichloramine, NCl3, or nitrogen trichloride. HOCl is approximately 100 times more effective as a disinfectant than OCl. Both types of residuals act as disinfectants, but differ in their capacity to produce a pathogen-free water supply during the same contact time. Remember, the presence of a measurable chlorine residual is what indicates to the operator that all possible chemical reactions have taken place and that there is still sufficient available residual chlorine to inactivate any microorganisms present in the water supply and to protect the distribution system water quality. Generally, free chlorine is a substantially more potent disinfectant, but the residual will dissipate in large distribution systems. Combined chlorine residual will not readily dissipate, but is much less potent than free chlorine and can cause chlorine-related taste and odor complaints from customers. There are several factors that affect the efficiency of disinfection. These factors include the dose, residual type and concentration, pH, temperature, turbidity, and concentration X time, or CT. In general, the highest levels of pathogen inactivation are achieved with high chlorine residuals, long contact times, high water temperature and good mixing, low pH, low turbidity, and the absence of interfering substances. pH and temperature have the most impact on pathogen inactivation by chlorine. For example, chlorine disinfects water much faster at a pH around 7.0 than at a pH over 8. On the other hand, the higher the temperature of the water, the more efficiently it can be treated. For instance, water near 70 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 to 29 degrees Celsius is easier to disinfect than water at 40 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 4 to 16 degrees Celsius. Longer contact times are also required to disinfect water at lower temperatures. Another factor mentioned is turbidity. Under normal operating conditions, the turbidity level of water being treated is very low by the time the water reaches the disinfection process. Excessive turbidity greater than 5 NTU will significantly reduce the efficiency of the disinfecting chemical or process. Now that all the disinfection efficiency factors have been addressed, there are several chlorine residual goals and monitoring points that are important to note as well as a few disinfection inactivation goals for viruses, Giardia, and Cryptosporidium. Because of chlorine's extremely high virus inactivation efficiency, CT values are almost always governed by protozoa inactivation. All public water systems in Maryland that are required to disinfect must meet a minimum of 0.2 milligrams per liter free chlorine residual at all points in the distribution system. The Safe Drinking Water Act, or SDWA, maximum residual is 4.0 milligrams per liter total chlorine residual and 0.8 milligrams per liter for chlorine dioxide. Systems that utilize surface water or groundwater under the influence of surface water, such as springs and shallow wells, must demonstrate four log or 99.99% inactivation for viruses, three log or 99.9% inactivation for Giardia, and 2-log, or 99% inactivation, for cryptosporidium. These treatment levels are based on a combination of filtration and disinfection. This process should be discussed with the Maryland Department of the Environment. Monitoring for disinfection effectiveness is accomplished by collecting and analyzing samples for chlorine residual and the presence of total coliform. SDWA sets the minimum sampling frequency based on population served. All public water systems must follow a coliform sampling site plan that is approved by MDE. Chlorine residuals must be measured when coliform samples are collected. Sample collectors must be certified to collect compliant samples. Remember that the minimum required monitoring is not enough to ensure that your water system disinfection is adequately monitored. Every public water system should establish chlorine residual monitoring locations that include each point of disinfectant chemical application and points throughout the entire distribution network, including dead-end water mains. 
pH and chlorine residual should be sampled at least once daily at each application point, and even in very small systems that utilize groundwater, the residual and pH should be tested daily at a minimum at one point in the distribution system. More frequent testing is required for surface water systems. The distribution sample sites should be rotated so that the entire system is covered in about one to two weeks' time. Records of all monitoring should be maintained and submitted to MDE on the Monthly Operating Report, or MOR. The method used to measure chlorine residual is important. The primary approved method, because it yields accurate results, is DPD. To calculate the chlorine dosage of water being treated, we need to know the chlorine feed rate in pounds per day and the amount of treated water in million gallons per day, or MGD. With this information, we can calculate the chlorine dosage in milligrams per liter. Let's discuss the basic chemical feed formula. The chemical feed rate in pounds per day equals the flow rate, MGD, times the dosage, milligrams per liter, times the density of the water, 8.34 pounds per gallon. This formula can be rearranged using the Davidson pie method. Chlorine dose, milligrams per liter, equals chemical feed, pounds per day, divided by the sum of the flow, MGD, times 8.34 pounds per gallon. Mixing chemicals and adjusting dose rates should be done by following a written standard operating procedure, or SOP. This ensures that all operators follow the same procedure and do so accurately. When we determine the chlorine dose in milligrams of chlorine per liter for the water we are treating, we must add enough chlorine to the water to meet the chlorine demand and a desired chlorine residual. If we wish to know the chlorine demand, subtract the chlorine residual from the chlorine dose. Because the formula is for straight 100% chlorine, a dilution factor must be applied when using sodium or calcium hypochlorite. Simply divide the pounds per day by the dilution factor. For example, if you are using 12.5% sodium hypochlorite, then you would divide the desired pounds of chlorine by 0.125 to obtain the pounds per day of sodium hypochlorite required to produce the same dose. As previously discussed, Good monitoring and record keeping practices are essential to maintaining adequate disinfection. In addition to the results of chlorine residual and bacteriological monitoring, the water system operator should record the total amount of chemical that is applied to the water each day. Once these values are established, the ultimate decision of which type of feeder to use arises. This decision depends on the type of compound, availability of the chemical, and form, be it dry or liquid, and the amount to be fed daily. As a safety precaution, you should always add the concentrated chemical to water to avoid injury. Never add water to a concentrated chemical. It is the responsibility of each water system to ensure that all chemicals that are applied directly or indirectly to drinking water are approved by the National Sanitation Foundation, NSF. Because chlorine is a strong oxidant and extremely corrosive, Special storage and handling considerations should also be considered in the planning of a water treatment plant. Safety in handling chemicals is important. All operators must take proper precautions, including the use of appropriate personal protective equipment, PPE. Operators should also be trained to respond to spills. A material safety data sheet, MSDS, for each hazardous chemical must be kept on site and readily accessible to all employees. When preparing to handle a chemical, the MSDS for that chemical should be reviewed. Chemical storage and feed systems should be set up inside secondary containment vessels to prevent a spill from the primary vessel from reaching personnel, critical equipment, floor drains, and, most of all, the water supply. Chemical vats should be housed in a well-ventilated area separate from equipment that is subject to damage by corrosion. Feed pumps should also be installed with backflow prevention devices. Special care should be taken in reference to the actual operation of the equipment within the facility. Before starting a piece of mechanical equipment such as a mixer or chemical feeder, be sure that the unit is properly installed, feed line connections are tight, the unit is lubricated if required, and its operational status is known. 
Be certain that no one is working on the equipment and that all valves are in the proper position before starting chemical feeders. It should be noted that chemical feeders must be calibrated on a regular basis to verify proper chemical feed rate. Always calibrate chemical feeders against working system pressures to avoid errors. In liquid chemical feed systems, the volumetric method is probably the most accurate calibration technique. This method involves the use of a calibrated container, usually a graduated cylinder, and a stopwatch to determine the volume of chemical fed during a given time period. Ideally, the cylinder and timer are part of the chemical feeder piping system. This procedure should be performed at least four times per year and whenever a pump is replaced or rebuilt. It can be used to calibrate the chemical feed pump over the full range of feed rates, and this information should be recorded on a calibration curve. The accurate feed range for the specific feeder, i.e. 20 to 90 percent of maximum, presents an advantage in regard to higher stroke frequency, speed, versus longer stroke length for any given feed rate, allowing for a more consistent chemical feed. The operator should ensure that there are no interruptions in disinfection, such as allowing a chemical container to run empty while the well pump continues to produce water. The dose must also match the flow, so if the water supply pump produces a variable flow rate, then the chemical feeders have to be designed to vary the feed rate proportionally to the water flow. This is called flow pacing. Another method of minimizing interruptions and variations in dose is to control the dose with an online chlorine residual analyzer. To reduce the likelihood of an interruption in disinfection, the operator should make sure that there is an adequate supply of disinfectant in stock usually equivalent to 30 days, and that there are backup chemical feeders and spare parts on hand. Also, control system specialists should be available to respond in the event of a system failure. Another potential problem that must be avoided is an overfeed of chemical. There should be a flow sensor capable of shutting down chemical feeders in the event that the feeders are running when no water is being produced. Automatically activated alarms that notify the operator in the event of a system failure are recommended for small systems and essential for larger systems. However, it is still necessary to physically inspect each facility on a daily basis. The capacity rating of a solution chemical feeder is usually given in units of gallons per minute, GPM, or gallons per hour, GPH while dry feeders are often rated by the maximum amount of chemical that can be fed in a 24-hour period, pounds per day. Adjusting or changing the amount of chemical to be fed is generally accomplished by making a set point change in a computer program or by manually changing the feed rate setting on the chemical feeder. Adjustments are physically performed by turning a knob, adjusting a wheel, or by rotating a hand crank. Remember that any adjustment to the chemical feed rate should always be based on the desired dose of disinfectant to be applied to the water. This should be verified by measuring the actual output of the chemical feeder. In liquid chemical feeders, this is expressed as milliliters per minute. Milliliters per minute is then converted to gallons per day by multiplying milliliter per minute by 3,785 milliliters per gallon, and then by 1,440 minutes per day. Pounds per day is determined first by knowing the specific gravity of the chemical solution. Specific gravity can be determined by using a hydrometer, or if the chemical is fed in the same concentration as received from the supplier, the specific gravity can be found in the material safety data sheet. The weight per gallon of chemical is determined by multiplying the specific gravity by 8.34. Finally, to determine the quantity of chemical solution being fed, you would multiply the weight per gallon by the gallon fed per day. As explained earlier, once you know the pounds per day feed rate, you can determine the dose concentration in milligrams per liter by using the Davidson pie chart. One thing that operators can do to improve disinfection effectiveness is to regularly flush the distribution system. 
This helps move stagnant water out of the system and also removes biofilms that deposit on the interior pipe walls. Biofilm can shield bacteria from being inactivated by the chlorine in the water. Under the general permit program, the state of Maryland requires that any water containing a chlorine residual when discharged to a storm drain, as in the case during flushing operations, must be treated to remove the chlorine residual. This can be accomplished by using a dechlorinating agent such as sodium bisulfate, which can be added using a dispenser connected to a hydrant. Using chlorine disinfection in drinking water provides the safest and most efficient means of eliminating disease-causing pathogens in our drinking water. Flushing programs should not be random. Rather, they should be systematically designed to allow flushing of one section of pipe at a time, starting with the area closest to the pressure source, usually a storage tank, and working outward to the boundaries of the system. This is called unidirectional flushing and includes all parts of the system, especially dead ends. Dead ends may need to be flushed more often than other parts of the distribution system. One disadvantage of disinfection by free chlorine, especially with surface water systems, is the potential for the formation of disinfection byproducts, or DBPs. For example, halogenated organics are formed when natural organic matter, NOM, reacts with free chlorine. Total trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids are common disinfection byproducts. However, the use of chlorine has numerous advantages in addition to producing a disinfectant residual, such as it oxidizes soluble iron, manganese, and sulfides, enhances color removal, and can reduce overall taste and color. Other advantages may include the enhancement of coagulation and filtration of particulate contaminants as it acts as an effective biocide and is the easiest and least expensive disinfection method regardless of system size. It is the most widely used disinfection method and therefore the best known. While all methods of water disinfection have some disadvantages, the advantages far outweigh the negatives in regard to disease control and overall public health and safety. Chlorination is the most common disinfection method for public and private drinking water systems. With adequate residual chlorine and contact time between the disinfectant and the microorganisms, chlorination effectively kills many disease-causing organisms. Additionally, chlorine is inexpensive, easy to control, generally safe to use, and adapts to municipal or private systems. Overall, Though methods have and will always vary, the choice of which disinfectant to use must be made locally with care and in full recognition of both site-specific factors and the communities whose thirst is quenched daily thanks to those who work to treat our drinking water.